yo, what's going on, everybody? This is your friendly neighborhood knucklehead, and this is the Part-Time Artist Podcast. This is episode 171. We have made it to the end of 2023, and you know what that means. What's on deck is my 2023 radio show. So if you reached uh, or if you put out music in 2023 shoot me an email part-time artist podcast at gmail.com send me a link to a band camp song one song from your band camp i'm gonna check it out if i dig it i'm gonna put it on their radio show um that's my shout out for that um as always, I'm going to have my affiliate links, uh, you know, a couple ways to donate to support the podcast. There's a link to MailChimp. There's a link to DistroKid. I use both of those services for my email list uh, on MailChimp and to put my music on streaming services. That is DistroKid, and DistroKid will give you a little bit of a discount, same thing with MailChimp. Uh, lastly, I want to say that 2023, man, this was a really awesome year. I feel like this year I really took back my identity as an artist. And um, if you've been following me on YouTube, you really have seen the journey that is my creativity. So um, if you haven't been up... Uh, if you haven't been updated on that, I really encourage you to check out the YouTube channel that I have. Um, there's links to it on all of my social medias and everything. Um, Instagram is the best way to follow me, but my YouTube right now, I'm putting out advice for artists. The more I learn, the more I put out. The same thing is going on with the blogs that I put out on my website. The more I learn, the more I put out. And... This is something I said to my therapist uh, in our last session. I said, it feels like the more work that I do on myself, the more work is given to me. And I don't say that to complain. I say that because that's the growth. That's been what 2023 has been for me. It's been growing and doing the work. That was the year of doing the work. So 2024, I'm going to continue to do the work, and I'm hoping to see even more cool stuff come out of it. Um, I love being able to talk to artists on this podcast. I love being able to make YouTube videos. I love being able to write blogs and put things out on social media. So um, if you're tuning in just for this show, definitely check out the other stuff I have going on. Um, also, finally, uh, I say finally, but it hasn't been that long. Cart Music released the War Park live session that I did here in Philly. So I'm really stoked about that. Check out War Park's YouTube or check out War Park on Instagram. Our link tree will have that video of our live session. And if you want a live session with your band, contact cart music here in philadelphia they do it and they do it really well and they do it really cheap unbelievable all right let's get into the show i have with me a very very special couple of guests hailing from the band hex engine right here in philadelphia i have ron and bob thank you guys so much for coming on the show on this Monday night when I know the, the the Eagles are just minutes away and we're all just on the edge of our seat. But thank you guys for coming on. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having us. Happy to be here. All right. So now I know with creative people um, and just with humans in the United States, like we everybody has mixed feelings about the holiday season. Everybody has mixed feelings about the winter time. Some people love it, some people hate it. Most of the people I feel like that come from the hard rock metal background, they tend to like winter. They tend to like to to layer up and, you know, put on the leather jackets and stuff like that. Um and I wanted to ask you guys, what is one thing that either you appreciate about the holiday season 
or one thing you just enjoy about it. I like that it's cold and it drives everybody inside. Uh, <laughs> fewer people I got to interact with in my day and right. uh, more people that are going to be out at the bar too. So good for music. Ah, good for music. Interesting. Yeah, you certainly see a whole uptick in sort of, uh, you know, the numbers during the winter months. Really? Summer months, especially, yeah, especially in the Philadelphia area. Wow. What do you think? Oh, more people are out. But everyone's at the beach. You know, everyone goes down uh, to the, you know, the Jersey Shore. They go down, to, you know. You're right. Uh, Maryland, they're all on vacation. So in the wintertime, we actually get, typically get better numbers at our shows than we do in the summer. Nice. What do I like about it? I like the fact that I have now managed to coin the term Hexmas. Hexmas? From Xmas, we've it is now Hexmas in, in, wow. uh, in honor of Hex Engine. <laughs> it is it is our official holiday. Really? So um, when is yes, that? I, I would, is that coming up? Well, I encourage everyone to go out and buy our CD and give it to a loved one. <laughs> I love it. You know, it's the perfect you say, Mary Hex stuff. That's, that's the way to do it, right? It's wow. all about branding. It's all about marketing. We, yeah, we. You know, I uh, I'm not you know actually a huge Kiss fan, but you got to give it to them that they know how to market things. So I yeah. think we're going to try to lean into that. Sure. We have Hexmas, you know, and then uh, I'm still working on a play on words with Valentine's Day and Easter and every other holiday. Hexaween. Hopefully we can find a way to brand it for every every season, um, right. you know, but you know, if you're still looking for a gift for your loved one, uh, absolutely other people's online and it's a great gift. Nice. Now, now let's talk about Hex Engine for a minute because I noticed that you guys have at least one of your genres like to me when i listen to you guys to me like i grew up listening to this these kinds of tunes as heavy metal but um i think now heavy metal has been pushed around into like all these different places um and i saw i think it's on your band camp and stuff that we have stoner metal stoner rock stoner as a genre and i just wanted to ask like it's it's like where does stoner come in as a genre all of a sudden? At the same time, when someone says stoner rock, I was like, you know what? That kind of makes a lot of sense. Like I can see that, but at the same time, wh how did this happen? <laughs> well, I, I'll leave it to Bob to name check highest and like elder like fifty times. Uh, right. But I would say, you know, d the primer for stoner rock, like, hey, uh, think about like the first thirty seconds of Black Sabbath's War Pigs. Like, what if that were a ten minute song and that's stoner rock? Mmm. Yeah, we just lean into the lean into the groove a little bit yeah i want um i want everybody let's just i just want to jump straight in here to the tunes to give everybody a chance to to hear what we're talking about this is the the second tune on the debut record from hex engine it's called parasites check it out Thank you. 
That tune was called Parasites, and um, the band camp is hexengine.bandcamp.com, H-E-X-E-N-G-I-N-E.bandcamp.com. And it's so interesting that you brought up Sabbath, because one of the things I wrote down here was when I first listened to you guys, when I first listened to this record... Uh, I went downstairs and my dad was painting and he puts on the first Black Sabbath vinyl, puts it on vinyl. So you hear all the all the bullshit and, uh, you know, scratches and, and, and dust and all that stuff. And I was after listening to your record, listening to that record, I was just like, oh, my God, like this Sabbath record must be so important. Do you guys feel like that birth, that first Black Sabbath record, like how important was that for music? It was, uh, I, I don't know if I could say to music, uh, to my life, it was pretty, you know, game changing. Yeah. Right. Uh, all the early Sabbath stuff. Um, yeah. What, what's your relationship to Sabbath, Bob? So in, <laughs> If we're first of all, I, I want to make it clear that we did not come up with the stoner rock or stoner metal genre. Yeah, that, that name has been in existence now for the better part of a decade, decade and a half, as we're subdividing genre on top of genre. Yeah, and yeah. frankly, it's really a very open genre, and it's more about a certain vibe in music. You know, it's really just about sort of the the the, the riff laden song, mm-hmm. um, and it's about a certain you know, feel that you you generate that being said the absolute absolute progenerator of um of stoner rock is black zap they are the godfathers of what would be considered stoner metal i mean they're mm-hmm. the godfathers of heavy metal so yeah yeah that first album is is enormous um and so you know if you trace the roots of where we are i mean primarily the largest influences on the sort of music that, that I've listened to is, you know, Sabbath and Zeppelin, the Beatles, um, and then, you know, and the newer music, when I say newer, I mean 90s on, sure. you got bands like Caius, uh, Queens of Stone Age, who are kind of, you know, one after the other. Sure, um, okay. And yeah. then bands like Dozer and uh, uh, Clutch uh, is a huge influence on everything we do. Um, bands like Red Fang, and the funny thing is, is if you're listening to those those bands, you'll be like, well, they really don't sound like each other, but deep down, they they all invoke the same emotion. There's all there's a sort of a, a, a underlying sameness to them all, even though the music is really quite different. Where you've got like a band like Red Fang has got a lot more hardcore roots and stuff, and and their stuff is a lot more punkish on one side, whereas Caius is um, if you're not familiar familiar with Caius, you know they're from the early '90s, and yeah, they yeah. were basically straight descendants of uh, uh, of of Sabbath. Yeah, and they did things that you know created a whole subgenre themselves. But you got, um, you know, Fu Manchu came out of that scene, and, sure, and yeah. bands like that. But it's all sort of the same thing. Just get like a really cool riff. Yeah. And get that groove going and play it for 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> you know, while everybody and passes that's the, whole the blunt idea. around, like, right? Know, <laughs> or the joint or whatever. Yeah, and and you know the stoner, they call it stoner rock. 
it doesn't mean you got to be stoned to listen no, to yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. It really doesn't hurt, but you don't have to, <laughs> you know, and and it's all about kind of getting yourself in that groove and putting yourself in that state of mind. And there's different ways to do it, but it all comes down to that sort of feel. And again, you know, there's you can point to a few bands back in the late 60s, early 70s that really kind of led that off. And uh, certainly that first Black Sabbath album, you know, could be looked at as like sort of the very beginning point, the touchstone for sure, yeah. um, this entire movement. And yeah. It's very strong today. There's a lot of great bands out there, a lot better than us, frankly. Um, that should be, you know, that if you like this kind of music, yeah, you can listen to it, you know. Yeah, it definitely reminded me of when I was going to like see in the early in the in the two thousands, I was seeing bands like The Sword, I was seeing bands like uh Mastodon and um and how they took on like Pat the Torch from all of those like nineties groovy um you know hard rock bands um yeah i want so now let's get into and and here's another thing about stoner rock that and and like sleep bands like sleep there like oh, yeah. the other thing about stoner rock and i think that this is something that even translates past the music is there's always really trippy visuals there's always really intense like color schemes and things like that. Cause I remember going to like the merch table at like a, a sword show or a Mastodon show. And, <laughs> and these visuals will be so colorful and sometimes really elaborate. It's on album covers too. And I really love that you guys steered right into that because if you buy the tunes on Bandcamp, you'll see that every song has its own cover and it's vastly different colors. And I was just like, wow, this is such a cool little Easter egg. So get the tunes on Bandcamp so you can see all of the cool colors because um, I know that is definitely a stoner rock or whatever principle to have that kind of artwork. Now let's talk about this album, Other People. What this is your debut record. Um, other than just being like, "Fuck yeah, we made an album. Here it is. It kicks ass. We want to rule the world. We're feeling great." Other than like that excitement, what what were your intentions behind putting this record together? I think a lot of bands will say they have like kind of like a, a DIY aesthetic. I would say we have more of a DEY one, which is we do everything ourselves. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I would start by saying uh, other people is a really good representation of us being massive control fr freaks from top to bottom. Oh, God. Um, yeah. We want it. We had this vision of we want this album to sound raw and and just kind of grimy and. Um, to make that happen, we did nearly everything ourselves. I think there's like input from like three people. Um, uh, our drum recording engineer, uh, Mike Kirchner at, at the Dark Church. Um, our, our buddy Joe Kenny came, like slotted in to play some organ for us on uh, on a couple tracks. And uh, beyond that, we had Stephen from uh, the Stone Eye do the mastering. Everything else, soup to nuts, it was us yeah. recording, mixing, the whole yeah. thing. Um, the vision for that album was uh, one where we wanted to like, and you can hear this because Drew, our guitar player, did the uh, the mixing and recording process for everything else. We wanted to give him a playground and and kind of push him to the edge a little bit too, huh. so you can hear how much guitar work he's doing throughout the whole thing. Yeah, and uh, how abusively we used him to record every little nuanced thing. Um, mm. So yeah, he probably lost a few years in that recording process. <laughs> uh, but we really wanted the music itself and the artwork and everything to kind of convey the same thing of sort of the importance of a groove and establishing a like a rhythm okay and then creating a variation and then returning to it so the album artwork itself it's all variations on the same kind of kind of view of other people sort of having that feeling of you know the psychic trauma of dealing with uh people outside of yourself and being an outsider and sure. kind of just dealing with that slow motion train wreck of dealing with everybody around you and how they impact your life. Um, so we wanted it to be kind of shadowy in that respect. We also wanted that, that feeling that we had when we were writing the songs to kind of come through in the recording process. 
we want it to be very, very gritty. And I think you can hear that in like the drum sound and the weird choices Bob makes on drums. Um, yeah, I definitely think these are tunes that that bear like multiple listens. Because there's like even though there could be this real repeating element and and it has the minutes to it, so you get time to digest it, there's still like something that will click differently when you listen to these tunes like another time. And I think that is another problem, like a, a quality of stoner metal or stoner rock or whatever. Like when you listen to it when you're not stoned and then you listen to it when you are stoned, it's like, wow, this is another experience, I guess. And, you know, when I, when I took a music, I remember taking a music theory class in college and the professor was like, every time I listen to classical music, even if I've heard the piece like a hundred times, I always hear something new. And I think that this type of music and a lot of types of like hard rock and, and, and metal music, they have those kinds of qualities to them. Um, and with that, I wanted to ask you a couple of specific questions about songs on this record because... Most of the songs on this record are over five minutes. You have, you know, you, you you know, you hold it down with the composition and the uh, format, I guess we'll say. Um, but there's this one tune called Deja Sku. I don't know if that's how you say it, but it's like a two minute Deja Sku. Deja Sku, where I'm listening to it and. I, in my head, I'm like, what? How come this one isn't isn't going after two minutes? It was like a two minute instrumental, which is hilarious to me because most of the time, metal bands when they do the instrumental track, it's always like the longest one, you know, the Orions or whatever, you know. And for you guys, it was the other way around, where the instrumental track was the quickest one. How come that track didn't go anywhere? It never got vocals. It never you know, went into a 10 minute solo or anything like that? Uh, that is a good question. Um, <laughs> there is, that's the brainchild of, uh, uh, Drew Campbell, our guitar player. Um, okay. so I kind of speak a little bit to our songwriting process and I, I'll, well, I'll turn it over to you on this one too. Uh, I'll, I'll do the cue up for you. So, um, that one came out of the recording for excuses um ex uh, excuses excuses like it's this long sprawling song that like brings in an organ at the end um and we had this idea as we were doing it like let's bring in the organ and then it'll, it'll fade out to it'll, it'll fade out to just that at the end mm. bob's idea and I'm, this is where i'm gonna hand it to him he's like what if we did the opposite of that too <laughs> you can always so count on someone studio, for that <laughs> Yeah, so in the studio, we had to record the end of uh, excuses, excuses, okay. excuses. We had to record the end as we faded out. Uh, we just went along uh. with it. We just kept playing it and playing it and playing it. <laughs> and then kind of towards the end, we just kind of went nuts and made a bunch of noise. And we got done with it. And we went back and listened to it. And we're like, eh, that was kind of fun. Too bad it's not going to make it on the album. Wow. So... Long story short, what we basically did was reverse engineer the song out of it. We we took the we took the organ piece, the key piece that was really it, it sounds like strings. It would be selling strings on the outro. Mm -hmm. We just basically relooped that and brought it back in as the beginning of a new song. So it's basically the same song. We're just Wow. Because we fade we were fading out and the, the strings were fading in. We're doing the exact opposite now. The strings are fading out, we're fading back in. And that's the finish that we had when we recorded it just for kind of shits and giggles, to be honest with you. Like, that was just just sitting around. We're like, yeah. So that's why it's called Deja Skew. Instead of Deja Vu, it's Skew because of excuses. That's what that, that's what that goes for. Wow. I feel like... I feel like we teed it off now to, to listen to Excuses, Excuses. So I feel like making an audible. We were going to play this song last because it has the minutes, but buckle up, everybody. Let's listen to this tune. It's called Excuses, Excuses. Check it out.
All right, welcome back. We <laughs> well, that tune was called "Excuses, Excuses." It's the fourth fourth track on the debut record from Hex Engine called "Other People." Now, I got another specific so uh, question here. The last tune on the record, "Fear the Future." Um, this tune it starts out with this interlude this creepy like seance backwards ritualistic stuff it put me right into when i put that second slayer cd into my into my uh you know into my disc man at the time i don't know if people know what that is but uh when i when i listened to the second slayer album and i just heard say notch say notch i wanted to know if that was a direct influence or a direct uh you know reference to that to that tune were we feeling slayer with that or is that just something that poked out accidentally well i would love to say yes but that's not true so <laughs> I, as much as i love slayer and i would love to be able to be like yeah i was channeling my inner slayer i was um we simply needed uh we knew that we wanted to have some sort of ethereal some sort of strange beginning okay. um, because that was really our trippiest of all songs and that's actually a highly processed version of me saying they will take your place basically with some other effects over top of it wow. so yeah so at the end of the day um you know all of our lyrics are written by our genius lyricist here ron <laughs> and um we i you know we try to throw some i, I don't know if you want to call them easter eggs but we're always trying to throw some effects in there um i'm really highly influenced by a lot of like queens of the stone age um i think okay. that the production value on songs for the deaf where they put in just little bits and pieces of people saying things and whispering things and singing things adds such a great layer to the music. The music is awesome by itself, but then you put all those other, other little effects in those little, you know, here, here and there. Um, it just really elevates the musicianship of everything. So we did, we, we spent some time throwing some Easter eggs in places um, if you listen carefully on certain songs and I'm not going to ruin the oh, song, wow. what it is, but there are some spots that like, you've got to pan hard, right on your stereo to be able to hear it, <laughs> but it's in there. Um, so we've That's done fun. some of that. That's and, fun. Yeah. And so the same thing with the opening of, of, uh, you know, fear the future. Um, you know, Ron talks a lot about sort of, uh, it's really open for interpretation, although it does have an exact meaning. Um, I don't think you don't want me to give that. I like talk about that. So I'm going to talk about that. But ultimately, one of the big, you know, uh, uh, theme there is, you know, they will take your place. That's you know the chorus. And um, okay. so, uh, so uh, you know, we're we're kind of making, kind of moving that around a little bit and trying to make it just sound a little weird. And yeah, I'm glad I hit home with you. I mean, that, that was the point of it. Yeah. It, it, well, it yeah, makes I, you think. I, that's a, that's a big another big quality for this kind of genre is that it's uh, you can put it on and just ignore it and like not think too much about it on the surface level. But if you really put it on and like actually want to pay attention to music as an artistic experience, it has room and space for you to do that, which I love. Yeah, I. With that song in particular, too, um, I think that's the meanest song we have on the album in a lot of ways because it's <laughs> yeah. really kind of playing against people's um, fear of change. And okay. there's all these people who are coming up behind you, an entire generation, and you think they're doing everything wrong. And like, guess what? You're you'll be dead, and they're going to take your place, and everything's going to change. Mm. Um, and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, mm. I, but I also think that's a song in particular. Um, it's really important to highlight two things that that's everyone in this band writes. And that's one that was written by the bass player, Christian. Uh, wow. and it is a weird, it's a weird groove. If you like pay attention to it for those verses. So, uh, often the other thing is often like vocals are, are a secondary instrument. Like that's really, in my opinion, like a yeah. real swampy bass song. Um, yeah. so a lot of these times I'm just trying to layer in, how do I make, the vocal part make the rest of this song make sense and i think we came up with a very trippy version of that for uh for fear of the future 
now you you mentioned everyone everyone writes um do you feel like are you guys bringing like riffs to the table and then kind of sewing them together or is one person just coming in and saying like hey i have a full song we typically bring parts to the table then beat them up um i'll let bob speak to that a little <laughs> bit more directly because he's the weird drummer that also will write guitar parts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we, I wrote, how many songs you wrote on our album? Eight, right? So I think I wrote nine. a quarter of the songs on the album. Nine, yeah, technically. Nine, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I did write a quarter of the songs. Um, our next album, I think I have half the, <laughs> half the songs written. Yeah, I've written half the songs on. Wow. And, you know, honestly, it's just like... Um, some of our songs are a matter of one of us comes in a room with with a riff and someone else goes, oh, I got something to go with that. Sometimes it's just, hey, we've got 80% of a song. We just need to come up with a bridge. Let's get some, you know, uh, arrangement done on it. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, these items like, like for example, um, Fear of the Future was 80% written out of the box. We had to put in one or two bridges and then it was just about arranging the parts that the flow properly, um, you know, which parts were our, our verses, which was our chorus, uh, bridges, refrains, that sort of thing. So it, it it's kind of a mixed bag, frankly. Um, some of the songs, um, Something's Burning, for example, that song was pretty much complete. I wrote that that song, that was mine, and I pretty much wrote that entire thing. Now, on the other side of it, I, I will reiterate, you know, go back to this is typically um, myself, Drew, Christian, uh, you know, Drew's our guitarist, Christian's our bassist. Three of us typically write the instrumental portion. Ron handles all of our all of our lyrics. Um, I think we've got one song that will never see the light of the day that, <laughs> that I wrote. We that always I wrote do. We all lyrics. do. Yeah. 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 We've got it's just a weird song. And um, I don't know, maybe someday it'll be on the B side of something. But. It's right. like the only song that I actually contributed any real lyrics to, huh. um, but the song itself is just so weird. I don't think we can we're gonna do anything with it. So for the primarily, you know, you've got you know the the guys on the instruments writing the parts for the instruments, the guy with the vo vocals writing the part for vocals, and somewhere we meet in the middle. And uh, but it works great. I, the big thing is that I I love is that we're four guys who all really really get along. You know, we really wow. all love each other. And because of that, no one's afraid to bring something to the table. Uh -huh. No one's afraid to say something. No one gets, you know, butt hurt when someone says, I don't think that's going to work. Let's try something different. You know, there's right. no egos in the room. And as a result, wow. the, the songwriting process is really smooth. I mean, we can literally yeah. sit down when we say, hey, we're going to write. And the last time we did that, we wrote two songs in one night. Wow. It just happened. Um, yeah. And it's, it's part of when we put this thing together, we, we, you know, I, I made a, a point of, um, I wanted to work with people, a, who were dedicated enough that they would be there for practice and be there to do things. Um, and be just people I got along with, uh, because that's such a big part of the creative process. You know, you can have a bunch of egomaniacs playing together in a cover band to come together and play on yeah, a Friday yeah, or Saturday yeah, night at yeah. the bar. But when you gotta lock yourself in a room and really put yourself to the you know the test of writing something and being able to say to somebody, hey, I don't think that's gonna work, you know, where you're not and it's coming out of love. Of, like I really care about the music. Yeah. That's more important. And guys can just take that and move on. That that's really important for you know, the for basically getting stuff written and for the longevity of a band. You you need to be able to, you know, sit down and get together and be friends with each other in the long yeah. run. So that's really important that I really like all these guys and it's a, it's a really uh, kumbaya. What can I say? Yeah. You're, you know, Put the egos career. aside. Yeah, Rick Rubin talks a lot about that and just, and when he produces music with people, he constantly has to reel artists back in, you know, and check their egos out. And don't worry about what people are going to think, you know, it's about the song. It's about what, what what are the ideas that are going to make the song better? What are the ideas that might not make the song better, you know? And, and just being real with each other and having that kind of communication where you can be real with one another, that's so, so important. 
And um, guys, the last thing I want to ask you guys is about your music and about this scene. Do you guys, are you guys just putting your heads down and making music and then making albums? Um, or do you guys kind of pay attention to what is going on in the music industry? And how do you feel this music translates with this generation? Because we are sliding into 2024, you know, and like this music sounds like it should be on a vinyl, but yet here we are, you know, di in the digital age. So I, I just wanted to know, how do you feel about like with this type of music in today's world? I feel like somewhere along the line, we wanted musicians and artists to become businessmen. And I don't <laughs> think those things are completely compatible. Yeah. Um, when they took the money out of music, I became a lot less concerned with like, how is this going to resonate with people? Or like, you know, there's no path to becoming like, hey, we're going to be rich rock stars. Like, <laughs> no, now it's just, oh, we're sick people who have to play music and uh <laughs> let's make the music that makes us that we'd want to hear right. and then that's it mm. so you know we'll uh we'll die uh broken penniless and in terrible shape uh from years of playing shows but uh we'll be happier for it i think <laughs> and how do you guys how how have the shows been going on too I know you guys have you did you guys you guys just had some debut record shows right when the album came out yeah uh I'll bring up two real quick we did a <laughs> uh an album release show back in July that was wild uh we broke at the uh a smoke machine that ne a fog machine that never ended like it just went on for a whole song which was wild like full lasers the whole nine. Oh um, boy and it's as stoner as it gets, right? It's just ongoing smoke yeah, we, and fog. We got the bar to have a signature drink for us, the Hexarita. Oh, my so, goodness. That was tasty. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the more recent show we played, we played a, Bob, Bob, a birthday show for Bob. So we did like a oh, packed house for that. Wow. And we, uh, we willed out a uh, birthday cake for him shaped like a tombstone. Just to remind oh him God. of his impending death. Yes. <laughs> Oh my God. Well, guys, um, it's so cool to see the relationship that you guys have and you just, you seem to be an engine. You seem to be true to your name, a well-oiled machine cranking out tunes. And it's especially cool to have that in Philly because being here in Philly and networking with a lot of musicians and a lot of bands, communication is not people's strong point around here. I mean, I got so many names of especially drummers <laughs> in my phone that would be like at one point we were going to be in a band and then I never heard from them again you know so um <laughs> so I just think it's very very commendable that you guys found the people that you that you got and you have the, the relationship that you have it it seems to be all working so congratulations on that congratulations on the new record everything is cool so we're gonna send it off with this last tune which is called rat fink rip on everybody 